Hello and welcome to this first lecture in a three-part series on the nervous system. Uh, this uh, lecture is designed for my ninth grade anatomy students who are awesome. But if anybody else wants to uh, follow along, please feel free to do so. Uh, jump aboard and, and enjoy this, this discussion uh, on the nervous system. Again, this is an introductory level lecture about the nervous system. So let's get started. You'll see in this uh, picture here of a neuron how the, 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 the dendritic nature of it is what it's usually referred to as. And dendrite uh, comes from a Latin word that means branching or tree-like. And so you'll see that there are these branching dendrites. They're called spiny dendrites that are, if you look in the upper right corner of the picture, there are primary dendrites as they come off what's called the perikaryon or the cell body of the neuron. Uh, and then you'll notice down at the bottom near the center there is labeled an axon. So those are the three primary parts of a neuron. There's the axon, the cell body, and the dendrites. And the dendrites are bringing in information down into the cell body, which would be like the central processing unit, the CPU, of the neuron. And then that impulse and whatever information is gathered gets sent down the axon away from the cell body and then that interacts with other neurons as well. And so what, what I want you to gather or notice from this picture of the neuron is all of the dendrites interconnecting. And this picture doesn't show it um, actually in, in a kind of a broader sense, but these dendrites are all interacting with dendrites from other neurons. And so the more interdendrite connections there are, the more information can be transmitted from one neuron to another and shared between neurons so that you develop this very complex neuronal network in, of course, the brain, which is our overall, our central processing center there. And so within the brain, we have about, about 100 billion neurons altogether. And each one of those neurons has somewhere, scientists estimate, around 50,000 connections. So that's an incredible number of connection, 100 billion cells, each one of which having around 50,000 connections. It's an amazing it, it, uh, network of communication that's going on within our brain that enables the human body to do all that it does. Conscious processes and of course unconscious processes that are going on and we don't even realize it and we have no uh, idea of, of what's going on. It's completely out of our conscious control. And so there are billions and billions of processes that are going on within our bodies uh, that we have no conscious control over. And where is this all beginning from? It's beginning in the brain from all of these these approximately 100 billion cells having all of these connections that are going on within our brain itself. So the complexity of the brain, the complexity of the nervous system is pretty much beyond what we can grasp. There are so many things that are going on within us and we can kind of observe these processes, but the, uh, hitting the point of explanation and the level of explaining how these processes occur or why they occur is, is beyond what we uh, can comprehend right now. There's still so much to be learned about the brain and how it functions and works together. Incredibly complex system. I mean, this is why, for example, you want to become the top dog of physicians, a neurosurgeon. How many years do they have to devote to this specialty? Well, on, on average, about at minimum 14, average about 15 or 16 years of, of education after high school. So post-secondary education, you finish 12th grade, you're not even halfway there in your education to becoming a neurosurgeon. You still have a, a, at least 14 years after you graduate high school of intensive training. Uh, that, that still awaits you. Um, and, and the reason why is because the nervous system itself is such an incredibly complex system of the body. It requires so many years of training to become an expert in just one particular region of the nervous system. Um, and that's, that's speaking in terms of uh, on the medical side of things. If you want to get a PhD, uh, that, that's just an, a lifelong study. Uh, of the nervous system of whatever particular aspect you choose to study. So there is, there is much, 
much research. There are many, many job opportunities that are available that are based on the nervous system, an incredible array of jobs and professions that have to do with the nervous system. So hopefully this system will inspire you uh, and begin to think about ways in which you, you know you could you could forge your career if you find the nervous system to be interesting anywhere from a neurosurgeon uh, if you want to go as f the, the, as far as you want to in the clinical aspect and the medical side to getting a PhD to becoming a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, you, it's just there's so many job opportunities that are available here so let's look at a, a, b a brief overview there are two major divisions to the nervous system there's the central nervous system and there's the peripheral nervous system so central we're talking about in the center of the body and so the organs that were that, that are going to be dealt with in the central nervous system or the CNS would be the brain and the spinal cord and they're located in the dorsal cavity. So you've got that cavity that houses those two organs. And so from that central nervous system running down the middle of the body, then from that comes the peripheral nervous system. And if you remember anatomy students, peripheral means out away from the center, going out towards the, the, the uh, external parts of the organ or the organism. The spinal cord conducts sensory impulses from the brain to the body or from the body to the brain. So in this case, taking in sensory impulses, that's going to be from the body to the brain. So we have our senses that are outside of us, the five senses of touch and taste and smell and seeing and hearing those we, we receive all these sensory impulses that are coming in through peripheral nerves entering into the spinal cord and then going up to the brain for processing so these sensory impulses are, are being taken in conducts motor impulses from the brain to effectors now effectors is kind of a generic term and in this case we're, we're mainly referring to the muscles and the glands so you want to voluntarily move a skeletal muscle. You want to raise your hand or you want to kick something. That's all uh, voluntary. And the impulse begins in the brain and then sends it to effectors. So we have two types of impulses. Sensory impulses, which of course relate to the senses, and motor impulses, which will then bring about, uh, often we, we can think, uh, an easy way to remember this is motor, muscles, movement, they all start with M, but it also relates to the glands as well. So like your endocrine gland and your exocrine glands, sweat glands and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the spinal cord is also what's called our reflex center as well. And so this is where reflexes are, are beginning from and then those reflexes of course are um, they're, they're out of our conscious control and they will enable our muscles to move without us uh, actually thinking about it. And we'll talk about reflexes later in, in these lectures when we get to, to the spinal cord. Yeah, this is a, the, the link down at the bottom. That's a, a good introduction to what neurons are. Um, I think I typed in YouTube overview of neurons and there was an interesting video there about just the basics of neurons and how they conduct things and a, a good overview of them. Along with the spinal cord, there is the brain for the central nervous system. And it receives input from the spinal cord as well as from its own nerves. So it has its own set of nerves that are serving it. Just like with the heart, we think, well, the heart pumps the blood and it sends the blood out into the body and it receives blood from the body. But what about nourishing the heart itself? I mean, the heart is made of cells, so it has to have some type of blood supply for itself. The brain has its own nerves as well. So there's its, it, is, it has its own intra-communication network going on within it. But it also, of course, controls the rest of our body as well. And it's the central processing center of the body. For, for everything, for all that occurs within us, conscious and unconscious. And then there are two types of tissue um, in the nervous system, white matter and gray matter. White matter, uh, these are would be bundles and clusters of axons. Remember, axons are, think of the axons kind of like, I don't know, maybe like the trunk of a tree. And then the dendrites would be the branching extensions that are coming out, out of the, the, the central cell body. So this is the, the axon. This would be the thicker part. And these are bundles of axons that are covered with fatty myelin. 
Uh, myelin is it, it's a lipid based compound and whenever these axons are covered with it the myelin gives it a white appearance and it's found in the brain and the cord. So the white matter is comes from this myelin. Now what is myelin? What's its purpose? And we'll talk about this later as well but I'll briefly uh, give you its general function. Um, it's basically like an, an insulative covering that goes around the axons because these are electrical impulses that are traveling from neuron to neuron and so to keep these electrical impulses within the axons and preventing the impulses from getting lost or transferred or or interfered with the myelin keeps it within the axon just like there's uh, there's the the insulation around say uh, an electrical cord for example like your charging cord for your Chromebook or your phone it's got this covering around it to keep the electrical impulse within the metal wire that's inside of there myelin kinda of serves the same purpose gray matter would be masses of dendrites and cell bodies so this would be the other two major components of neurons so white matter applies to the axons Gray matter applies to the dendrites in the cell bodies. They are not covered with myelin, so it appears gray. So they don't have this, this fatty myelin that, that covers it. Now, you say, well, it's going to lose its impulse. Well, remember, dendrites are communicating with each other. And so dendrites need to have this dendrite to dendrite connection that's going on between them. And if there were myelin there, well, then dendrites wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. And so the lack of myelin enables neurons to actually communicate with each other and to transfer impulses from one neuron to another. So the information goes from a dendrite to a dendrite down into the cell body and then it leaves through the axon. And then that information can be uh, transmitted to other parts of the body, brain, or, or wherever this, this impulse needs to go. There are these membranes and they're called meninges. And if you remember and my anatomy students, uh, my, my, I call them my anatomy stars. I taught you guys there are four types of tissues and there are five types of membranes. Do you remember the four tissues and the five membranes? I know it seems like it was years ago when I taught you this back in the classroom <laughs> when we were all together and we could see our smiling faces. So meninges, that was one of the five membranes. There would be the dura, arachnoid and pia maters. So the first blank dura, D-U-R-A, and then arachnoid, and then pia. And those, all three of those terms come from Latin. Dura, we get the words, for example, durable. So durable in Latin means hard or related to being durable, durable or tough. Arachnoid, so notice it ends in O-I-D. So if it has a suffix oid, it means it's like its prefix. And so a rack means web. And you've heard of arachnids, like spiders, or somebody has a fear of spiders, arachnophobia. So these are web, this is a web-like membrane. And then pia. Uh, maybe if you're in music and you see you're supposed to play uh, pianissimo or it might just say PIA, it might abbreviate it. PIA means very delicate, very soft. And the PIA mater is soft and delicate. It's very, very thin. And uh, you, you'll, you would see that in a brain dissection, which I plan on, on doing. I'll, I'll do a brain dissection here at home, uh, and then I will put that, I'll, I'll upload it on Tink Talks, uh, and then you can, you can observe a brain dissection. Of, of a sheep brain. And on that sheep brain, the sheep brains that I order, have the meninges intact. I want you to be able to see the meninges. Um, if we were in school, of course, you'd be able to feel the, amen the, the meninges, but we're not there, unfortunately. So you'll just have to watch, watch uh, Tink dissect the sheep brain. And then CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. And we produce this mostly watery fluid that is circulating around the brain and the spinal cord and we'll talk about that later that is found between the arachnoid and the pia maters so if you want to go in order from in terms of well where are the pia, where are the maters in, re, in relation to each other right on the surface of the brain and down into the folds of the brain and the and the cord would be the pia mater 
Then, as we move outward, next would come the arachnoid mater, and there would be a, there's a space in between the pia and arachnoid, and then after the arachnoid would be the dura mater, and then you would have the skull or the vertebrae. Um, and so that's that's how you progress outward from the brain or the cord uh, out to the out to the bone to the exterior. Again, it would be pia first, then arachnoid, and then the dura. And in between the pia and arachnoid is what's called the subarachnoid space, and that's where cerebrospinal fluid is found. Now, there's I have this video link, Dangers of Meningitis. It's a TED Ed video, great one. Of course, it's TED Ed, and it just talks about meningitis and uh, it as you probably already know itis means inflammation and so we're talking about inflammation of the meninges and meningitis can become very dangerous and we'll talk about that when we get to a discussion of what's called the blood-brain barrier um, and, and why meningitis is so dangerous and and what can be the complications of meningitis and so forth and how does it develop um, but anyway it's a, there's plenty of good videos about meningitis but this is one on TED Ed I'm I love Ted Ed. So the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is something that is essential to the, to the operation of the brain uh, and the spinal cord. The blood-brain barrier, it's tight cellular junctions between endothelial cells of brain capillaries. Okay, what does this mean? So your, your capillaries are only one cell thick. And the reason why is so that things can easily diffuse into and out of capillaries. Capillaries normally can open up when, when we have vasodilation, and it allows white blood cells to get out of the circulation and get to a region of uh, where there's infection or bacterial invasion or something like that. That's normally. Anywhere else in the body, that's what happens, but not with the blood-brain barrier. So what I want you to imagine is a, is a capillary, which is a microscopic tube, basically, and the cell wraps around on itself and forms this tube. And like I said, it's just one cell thick. But what these cells do in the blood-brain barrier is these what are called endothelial cells. Endo means within. Uh, these are the, the cells that, that form the lining of the capillary and actually pretty much make the capillary itself, they kind of like interlock. Like imagine you're interlocking your fingers together and one you have one hand folding over the other hand. So if you took your fingers of your right hand and you enclose them into the palms of your into the palm of your left hand, that's kind of like what the blood brain barrier is. And so it forms these tight junctions. And if there's any type of inflammation that occurs in the blood-brain barrier, that junction gets even tighter and tighter. And so this is a very tight junction between the cells. And what does it do? It maintains brain homeostasis. You want to keep things, especially in the central nervous system, very even. Everything needs to be kept at a level of homeostasis. The brain must be kept isolated from any changes in the bloodstream, particularly after meals or exercise. And so whenever you eat, you're consuming all of these, these different foods. They go through the digestive tract. Digestion occurs within the small intestine, not the stomach, primarily in the small intestine. Okay, there's a little bit of breakdown in the stomach, but the main digestive organ of the digestive system is the small intestine. Then those molecules that we derive from our foods get put into the bloodstream, and then the molecules that keep us alive get transmitted throughout the body through the circulatory system. Well, there are some compounds, like when we eat our foods, that we, we, we produce a large quantity of them, and we don't want them flooding the central nervous system because that can upset homeostasis. Exercise is the same thing because when we exercise, we release all kinds of hormones, um, and we don't want those hormones that are being generated and the other metabolic compounds that are produced from exercise and contraction of muscles, like say, for example, lactic acid, to get into the central nervous system. So the blood-brain barrier keeps the, the central nervous system protected. It allows essential molecules like oxygen and glucose to pass from the circulation to the central nervous system, but blocks more massive molecules like hormones and neurotransmitters so that they don't, they can't diffuse into the central nervous system. So um, 
this is this is what's keeping things from the brain but it's also and the cord but it's also keeping things within the brain and the cord as well so um, this is uh, a little more of a discussion then we'll look at a picture of one that kind of gives you an idea about how how the blood brain barrier functions by looking at its kind of how looking at its anatomy of it it also prevents most most pathogens from infiltrating the CNS so if you have some kind of bloodborne disease or you get some pathogens into your bloodstream not necessarily a disease or an infection but the bacteria are there or the viruses are in the bloodstream they cannot get into the central nervous system um, because of the blood-brain barrier so it prevents them from infiltrating and getting in immune system cells such as lymphocytes monocytes and neutrophils they cannot penetrate this barrier and so why is this a concern so why would that be a concern for us knowing that these immune system cells cannot penetrate the barrier think about that for a second these these immune system cells do what they protect us they phagocytize pathogens and and they take care of uh, of of these pathogens that infiltrate us and they neutralize them they kill them they consume them but they're not present around the central nervous system because of the blood-brain barrier and so we're vulnerable because of this however at the same time this prevents a full-blown immune response in the central nervous system and so these white blood cells can lead to inflammation in the production of a, of, a, of a protein called histamine which causes inflammation and swelling and vasodilation that would be bad that would be devastating for delicate neural tissue and so we want to prevent this full-blown immune response that, that would occur as a result of, of having these immune system cells there the blood-brain barrier creates challenges for scientists as they develop CNS drugs and chemotherapies so why would this be a challenge why why would the blood-brain barrier create this challenge well remember it's preventing things from getting into the CNS so if there is a brain tumor you can't just deliver the chemotherapy through an IV which is normally how chemotherapy is delivered so these drugs and these chemical compounds can't enter the central nervous system because of the blood-brain barrier so you could give somebody an injection of this this chemotherapeutic drug that is used to treat a brain tumor but it'll never make it to the brain tumor because it can't leave the blood-brain barrier it can't get out of the circulation and then get to the tumor so it would be as if you would just deliver the drug and it would pass right on by the brain tumor uh, and then it would never be able to do its job the chemotherapeutic drug has <clears throat> the ability to enter particular cells but if it can never get to those cells then it can never do its job and so what happens is uh, the, the drug would just it, it would be completely ineffective so many of these medications require what's called an intrathecal administration rather than an IV injection or taking a pill so intrathecal is whenever a medication is delivered directly into the cerebrospinal fluid and so this intrathecal administration would be down would be done down in the lumbar the lower lumbar region of the spine somewhere down below and around uh, lumbar number three lumbar number four so usually it's around l3 uh, and they deliver it there so they don't damage the spinal cord that could be devastating if they go up above there um, so an intrathecal uh, injection is what's given instead uh, this is a very tricky injection because it's going directly into the cerebrospinal fluid you have to, have to take so many precautions uh, so that uh, bacteria don't enter the cerebrospinal fluid and then now you have these bacteria that can grow unchecked within the cerebrospinal fluid and, uh, and, and infect the brain or the cord uh, because we don't have immune system cells there to, to, to defend us 
So an intrathecal injection is, is directly into the cerebrospinal fluid. This would be a deeper injection. Maybe you've heard of an epidural. Uh, an epidural we often associate with a woman giving, uh, giving birth. This is what, what numbs the, the mother who's about to deliver a baby. An epidural is above the dura mater and it, it diffuses through the dura mater and then gets into the central nervous system that way. Um, it's, it's not as, not as I should say, I guess I could say risky as an intrathecal injection, but sometimes intrathecal is the only way that a medication can be delivered, and so it has to be done intrathecally um, so that the medication actually makes it into the central nervous system. So the blood-brain barrier is just the, the, the capillaries that are within the brain and the cord, and they, are, they have very tight cellular junctions, so things cannot get out of circulation into the brain, and things around the brain cannot get into the blood-brain barrier as well. So it's all about protecting this delicate neural tissue. Uh, so that there isn't any kind of inflammation, encephalitis, which is inflammation of brain tissue, or meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges. Or sometimes both happens, where you get both brain tissue and the meninges becoming inflamed. The blood-brain barrier is essential. Uh, it, it's essential for our lives. I mean, we couldn't live without it. Uh, there would be so much homeostasis that would be thrown out of whack, the brain and the core would not be able to function which means then we wouldn't be able to function, obviously. Um, the top right picture, and yeah, I'm not real keen on that one, but the one on the bottom is, is pretty good. And, and so on the left side, you can see a kind of a, a, an artist's rendering of the endothelial cell. So what I want you to notice is the endothelial cell. There are these foot-like things. There's like feet that are on the surface. Ignore those for now. They're called astrocytes. Um, I want you to just look at the brain capillary endothelial cell. And down at the bottom, where they have a, a little rectangle around it, that's where that tight junction occurs, where the cell basically kind of doubles over on itself, and it makes this very tight cellular junction. So as blood flows through those capillaries, nothing can get out. So imagine you're trying to deliver a chemotherapeutic drug to a brain tumor, and it's stuck in the blood-brain barrier. It can't leave those capillaries and get to the tumor. So the drug can never do its job. So just a very tight cellular junction of those cells. This is a computer-generated image of the blood-brain barrier. Now, what I want you to, it's a mess, but it's actually quite accurate. It's generated from a number of electron microscope images, and they just kind of layered it one over the other, one over the other, and they generated uh, this, this picture of dozens and dozens of electron micrographic images. And then what I want you to notice is the blood-brain barrier, the capillary is that red tube that's kind of running through the middle at a slant. And all those cells around it, especially the ones that are touching it, they're called astrocytes, um, they are covering it, they're protecting it, and they're, they're preventing anything from uh, getting out. They're, they're keeping things from getting out of the capillary. So the capillary itself is, is tightly held together, but there are also these other cells that kind of ensure that nothing gets out of the, the circulation and then into the brain tissue or the cord tissue. So this is all, not all of this, but a lot of what's immediately around the capillary. They're all there to ensure the um, that, that nothing gets out of that capillary. So they're all there to protect the brain and the cord tissue. Okay, so cerebrospinal fluid, we talked about this a little bit ago. These are, this is a fluid that's produced in masses of special capillaries that are called choroid plexuses uh, within the brain. And these, these choroid plexuses are in the um, ventricles of the brain. And this is where the fluid is produced, especially in one, one of the ventricles called the lateral ventricle. And it's 99% water and 1% other chemical compounds that are dissolved in the water. Five primary functions for cerebrospinal fluid. Buoyancy for the brain. Um, it acts as a cushion for the brain as well. So the brain is kind of floating in 
the cerebrospinal fluid. It maintains chemical stability with it being 99% water. Water is the universal solvent, and so this leads to uh, chemical stability. Things have been dissolved in it to maintain brain homeostasis. It's a filtration system as well, so it filters out wastes. And it clears out wastes, especially when we sleep. So when, that's why whenever we are sleep deprived, we don't think too clearly. And one of the reasons why, and there are a number of reasons that are contributing to us feeling fuzzy headed and lack of good judgment, um, in, in particular when we're talking about cerebrospinal fluid, is that the waste that we produce from the activity of our neurons, which is a lot of waste, our neurons are extremely active, and they're producing a lot of waste chemical compounds, the cerebrospinal fluid will take care of that while we're sleeping. So while our brain goes into sleep mode, the cerebrospinal fluid can do its job. Well, if you're sleep deprived, we never get the opportunity to fully filter out and clear out all those wastes that have been building up and building up throughout the day. Uh, from our brain doing its job and being very metabolically active. So you deprive yourself of sleep, you have poor judgments, and you say dumb things, and all that kind of stuff. And the reason why is because you have wastes that are building up that never got the opportunity to be cleared out. Uh, it's located between the, the pia and the arachnoid maters, which is called the subarachnoid space. So there's a space in between the pia and arachnoid, and that's where you would find the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is around, again, it's around our brain and our cord. It goes all around our brains, only in the central nervous system. It flows uninterrupted through the CNS, through the cerebrospinal canal of the spinal cord, to the ventricles in the brain, then exits the central nervous system through veins draining the brain. So remember, this is mostly water, so a lot of this just gets put into our circulation. So it does this uninterrupted flow through around our brain and around the cord, and then it exits it, and it leaves. Constant volume, I should have two blanks here, um, I think the, the main thing is pressure, but constant pressure and volume must be maintained. Let's go with constant pressure because that's more, that's more important. However, if the volume changes, the pressure is going to change as well. So I guess you could say volume and pressure, but constant pressure must be maintained. And if it isn't, there are all kinds of uh, detrimental consequences from migraines to dizziness to blackouts to nausea and vomiting, there are all kinds of, of negative consequences of this. So how, when would this happen? So sometimes people get these little micro tears in their moters, either through trauma or it just happens, or maybe it's through some kind of athletic accident in gymnastics or football or something like that where you got hit pretty hard, or maybe a car accident, and a little tiny tear occurs within one of the moters. Well, CSF can slowly leak out of that tiny little tear, and as a result, all of these symptoms start to occur where you're you have a lot of dizziness and, and your vision is blurred or you see black spots in your vision or you, you have nausea, um, you, you feel like you need to lie down or bright lights are hard for you to, to look at. And the reason why is because you're, you're losing the pressure of the cerebrospinal fluid and then these, these, it's kind of like an alarm system goes off. The total volume of CSF in an adult is about 150 milliliters. So it's not very much, 150 milliliters. So uh, a liter is, is 1,000 milliliters. And a liter is approximately a quart. So we're only talking a little over one-tenth of a liter um, or one-tenth of a quart. Uh, we produce, however, about six to 700 milliliters per day. So that, that's what I was talking about where it, it leaves through the brain. So it's constantly circulating 
and we're producing it, but we're also it's also draining into the circulation as well because it starts to build up with waste matter and chemical compounds that need to be removed from the central nervous system. And so that's why we're producing a lot more than we actually maintain at any given time. So the volume needs to be around 150 milliliters, but we produce quite a bit more than that because it's constantly circulating and then leaving through these veins that, that drain the brain. Veins that drain the brain, that's fun to say. Um, and so we, we lose them, but then we keep, you know, we keep replenishing that supply as the cerebrospinal fluid moves out with the waste that have accumulated in it. Um, so it's a, it's a great system, and, and that's what's flowing around our brain and our cord. So the brainstem, now let's look at the actual parts of the brain itself. So we're going to look at the brainstem first, three parts. The medulla oblongata, often just called the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. The medulla, we'll start with that one, controls vital functions like breathing, heartbeat, and blood pressure. And it's also our reflex center as well. So this is all of our vital functions. And if um, where is the where is the medulla? So it's it's uh, at the at the base of the brain, and it's the part that that is right before it descends into the spinal cord itself. Um, up from the medulla, so I guess we could be we could be ascending up the brain stem. Next would be the pons. The pons is the relay station between the part of the brain that's called the cerebellum, the cerebellum, and the rest of the central nervous system. It may play a role in dreaming. So we think that the pons has something to do with our dreams and, and, and taking information that's still kind of there in our brain and trying to make sense of it or sending it to different parts of the brain. And that's why we have all these goofy ideas and, and, and thoughts when we have dreams um, because it's it's kind of like a bunch of noise that, that is incomprehensible. And yet our cerebrum, or the thinking part of our brain, is trying to make sense of it, and it just can't. And so our dreams are sometimes fantastic and far out. It works, the pons works with the medulla to regulate our breathing rate as well. So the, the pons is, is working very closely. It's kind of like where, where our breathing rate um, is it's like the center of our breathing rate and then working with the medulla it regulates it so that when we need to breathe in more oxygen when we're exercising for example the pons will, will initiate that um, so that we can not only take in more oxygen because our muscles are demanding it but also so that we can then get rid of the carbon dioxide that's building up in our cells as well as a result of the Krebs cycle so the pons is where this all initiates. It starts to recognize that carbon dioxide is starting to build up and the cells are demanding more oxygen and so the breathing rate goes up. Here's a cool video, Why Do We Dream? It's by Vsauce and he's got awesome videos. So check out this one. It's, uh, you could just type in Why Do We Dream and then put, there's tons of videos about Why Do We Dream, but if you want to see the Vsauce one, you got to type in Vsauce somewhere and uh, you'll, you'll get this video along with other great ones that he's done. The midbrain is the third part of the brain stem, and it acts as a relay station between the cerebrum, which is the largest part of our brain, a uh, part where we do a lot of our thinking and, and abstract reasoning and so forth, and the spinal cord or cerebellum. And it also controls our sensory processes. So this is where, so we, we have something like we taste something. Well, that information gets sent eventually to the midbrain. The midbrain then controls those processes and then we quote understand that we're tasting something or it sends it to the the taste center of our brain or if we hear something we send it to the auditory center of our brain. The midbrain is where all of that information gets sent and then the midbrain sends it to the appropriate regions of the cerebrum so that it can be processed and understood. Okay, that ends our part one lecture. I'll stop here and uh, then pick up with part two. Again, there are three parts to this lecture. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the first one, and uh, hopefully you're looking forward to the next two. Thanks for watching.